Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Bradley Campbell, and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Centre for Crop Science. Uh, today, we're going to hear from Professor Ian Godwin, a man who I have had the pleasure to know and work with for the past 19 years, and who will discuss the social and political arguments against GM crops and the science behind the battle for global food security. Professor Ian Godwin has over 30 years experience in plant biotechnology research, first undertaking sugar beet genetic engineering at Birmingham University in the UK in the 1980s. He joined UQ in 1990, holding an academic position in plant molecular genetics. In 2019, he joined Coffee as director of the Centre for Crop Science. His research focuses on the improvement of crops for food, feed, and bioindustrial end uses. He has pioneered the use of GM and gene edited techniques in sorghum. His research projects include international collaborations with a focus on food security and plant genetic resource conservation, with collaborators in Germany, Denmark, the United States, China, Ethiopia, and many Pacific Island countries. He is passionate about the public communication of science and has spoken at many public events on genetics, GM plants and food, animal cloning, and the future of agriculture in a changing climate. In 2003, he was an ABC Science Media Fellow and has appeared on ABC and BBC Radio on numerous occasions. His popular science book, Good Enough to Eat, Next Generation GM Crops, was first published in 2019. The presentation we will hear today was first presented at Briz Science in April 2019. Briz Science is a monthly lecture series that brings science out to the labs and to the people. Before we get started, I want to address a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a black menu bar. If you are having any technical difficulties, please click on the chat button and then send a message outlining your issue to all panelists. If you'd like to submit a question, click on the Q&A button and type your question in the message box. Ian will be answering questions after the live presentation. I'll now pass you over, Ian. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much for that, uh, that kind introduction, Brad. Um, I should say that, uh, that I didn't know Brad had known me for 19 years. It seems like a long time, but he was only seven when he came and joined the lab. Um, he's actually currently leading a, uh, a project um, that's it's a it's an international aid project looking at um, the conservation and characterization of of Pacific Island taro and its relatives. Um, anyway, that it's uh, it's great to be able to do this. I, I will say that it's um, wonderful to be able to do this presentation all over again, even though it's actually not me doing it over again. It's been recorded, so we're doing it's the ultimate in recycling, which is a, a wonderful thing to be able to do in these. Uh, in these interesting times. Um, and the, the talk that I gave for Briz Science was, was um, more or less a, a book launch in Brisbane, which was um, a really good thing to be able to do. Uh, I'd, I'd really love to be able to answer your questions at the end and, and Brad will be, um, will be going through the questions that people have asked and, and picking out some of the most interesting and, and apologies in, um, in advance if we can't get to everyone's question. Um, but now I'm going to hand over to the wonderful people from UQ alumni who, are, who have organised this event um, and they'll, they'll start the recording. Okay, so I'm going to talk about whether GM crops are actually good enough to eat. Um, the fact that I've spent 30 years or more working on them probably tells you I'm a little biased. Um, I do want to thank um, the science faculty for um, putting this on and also especially the, the, the library here. It's a wonderful place to be. Uh, but I also want to thank um, HBO for not releasing this until next week because otherwise I don't think a lot of you would be here. And uh, Joel's already mentioned uh, my book. It came out earlier this year. Um, you can get a hard copy if you want at Avid Reader or you can buy it online at, you know, all the good places, only good places that have my book, right? So, we'll start talking about food. And these are some of my favourite foods, well, except for the starfish, but they are food for some people. 
for some people it's an absolute delicacy. Um, you've even got some lovely little flowers in a bowl, um, which my wife and I went to one of those, you know, posh restaurants where the, it was all about theatre and art rather than the food. Um, I was glad they had matching wines uh, because I was full as a good by the end and it wasn't with food. Uh, but I want to I want to talk about my grandfather. He's the one here dressed. Some of you will recognise that that's the ostrich feathers that the Australian light horse um, used to wear. And of course, any young soldier who was going on an all expenses paid by the government trip to France or Gallipoli in the First World War got their photo taken with this one. He wasn't a light horseman. Uh, he ended up working um, in railways, what they call trench railways. Uh, when I was 10, my granny died and he came to live with us and, you know, I was always keen to find out about his, what he did in the war, you know, did you shoot Germans and things like that because, you know, that's what you do in the war, right? And uh, one day it was breakfast time and I, I was well brought up, of course, had wonderful table manners and I said, Grandfather, would you like some jam? And he said, what sort is it? And I said, it's plum. And he said, I swore if I ever got through the war, I'd never eat bloody plum jam again. <laughs> so that, that was, uh, I guess it was PTSD. I don't think it had been invented then, and I was 10. It hadn't been invented in my brain. Um, this, is a, this is one of the favourite postcards where we've got a soldier asking the eternal question, he's eating plum and apple jam. What the hell is, when the hell is it going to be strawberry? And the fact was that it was the officers who always got strawberry and the enlisted folk got, got the, well, it was called plum and apple, but it was made by a mob called, whoops, sorry, I'll go back. It was made by a mob called Ticklers in the north of England. And it turns out that, firstly, no one liked the jam. Secondly, Ticklers turned out to be the biggest destination for British-grown turnips and Swedes <laughs> during the First World War. So that was probably what the main ingredient was. But the soldiers quite liked it because you could throw the jam out and there was a shortage of hand grenades, so they could make what they called Ticklers bombs. Very, very effective. Now, you all know that food's going to kill you, don't you? We all have food phobias. Every day we're told us what, what's going to kill us. This was actually very, this, this was published only four days ago, so this isn't in my book, obviously. Uh, but when you ask people what's the main risks about what you eat, a lot of people are going to come up and say, oh, you've got to give up red meat. It'll kill you, it'll kill the planet. Well, that's what the death rate is with a, a, a high in red meat. So we can actually see that it's, it's sodium, salt, and not eating your whole grains. So you've got to eat a lot of whole grains. So this, this is number of deaths in thousands per 100,000 in the population. So a lot of people die from not eating whole grains or eating too much salt. So I'm going to impose a few of my values on you because a lot of people's attitudes are to do with their values. Uh, I'm going to firstly, I'm just going to put this out there and say celery, to my mind, is probably not food. When I was an undergraduate student, I worked out at Stanthorpe one summer, cutting celery. What I discovered was, I didn't really like celery. By the time I finished cutting celery, I hated celery. The smell, the sight, even the sound, that crunch. Oh! Because that was the sound it made when you were cutting it. And it was loaded with Furano Kumarans. Unbeknownst to me, but I quickly find out, because two days later, I started to get blisters on my arms. Like all celery pickers get, these things actually sensitise your skin to ultraviolet radiation. Celery is not food. It's a poison. It's a toxin. <laughs> chocos, definitely not food. Some of the young people probably don't even recognise chocos. It was one of those foods that was probably very popular in the Great Depression. And seeing my parents grew up in the Great Depression, they felt they had to impose it on me. But my grandfather, the man who wouldn't eat plum jam, he also wouldn't eat tinned pears. What's the relevance? Because he said it was just chocos boiled up in sugar. Maybe he was right, or that was a depression thing as well. It's nice, isn't it? 
it's actually got a terminology to describe it. It's phytodermatitis. This is actually from limes. There's even a syndrome called margarita mouth, and it comes from drinking lime margaritas in the sun. And who in their right mind would drink a lime margarita inside? <laughs> I ask you. There's been cases of people who have had celery soup and gone out swimming and turned bright red and become blistered from those Furano Kumarans. Now, I just want to do, I, I will mention to you, my dad was an absolute cricket fanatic. He wanted me to play for Australia. I couldn't bat, I couldn't bowl, but I'll tell you what, I was a pretty good throw. I've got a lime here and I know how to use it, so be alert that I am armed and dangerous. Don't go out in the sun after this lime hits you in the head. So, one of the things about food is it is a kind of magic because everything we eat has undergone a level of domestication because most things in nature, for very good reason, are poisonous. And we've selected things that aren't poisonous. We've also selected from Tio Sinte what is now modern maize. These are effectively pretty much the same species, but because we have selected them through domestication, we now have many of the foods that we have do not exist in nature. This is one of the best examples because if you want to be a food, well, you don't want to be a food, you just want to be a seed. And if you want to be a seed and are good at passing your genes on to the next generation, the best thing that happens when you're mature is you shatter, boom, and the seed gets dispersed. There's no seed dispersal on a maize cob. It just drops on the ground, they all try and germinate. It pretty much guarantees that nothing's going to survive into the next generation. I'll just talk to you a little bit about plant breeding because one thing about plant breeding and selection is it's a fairly recent 20th century invention in many ways. Um, you will note this is the yield of maize in the United States for... It, 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 and if, if the graph went back further, it'd be like that. Hardly any change. There's little ups and downs usually to do with drought. Hybrid production was introduced in the 1930s. Shortly after that, the first application of urea-based fertiliser, a synthetic nitrogen fertiliser. And shortly after that, this is what my plant breeding lecturer called the horse's ass syndrome. When you're ploughing between fields, or doing any sort of application of anything, you have to be able to fit a horse down between the rows. As soon as horses became not necessary, farmers actually twigged to the fact, we can actually grow these plants a bit closer. 30 inch rows was what happened. And as we can see, maize breeding has led to huge increases in maize yield compared to the background. That's what plant breeders have given us. And then more recently, Transgenic plants, or GMOs, have built on that even further. The first transgenic plants were actually made in a lab only in 1983. Um, and you can see this beautiful illustration here by Lara Simone, who's one of the postdocs at, in my building at UQ, just showing you that basically agrobacterium, nature's genetic engineer, can actually transfer genes, and all we have to do is change the genes that it transfers, because it normally causes a disease by transferring a bit of DNA to a plant. We change that and make it put in a gene for disease resistance, for better nutritional quality, etc., and we can do that. Of course, it works better with tobacco, because everything works with tobacco. When I was a postdoc, I was working in a lab, I was working on sugar beet, but there was a guy there working on tobacco. The aim of his project was to increase the nicotine content in tobacco. It was paid for by a tobacco company. He was shameless, absolutely shameless. And at that time, as we all know, all of the tobacco companies said, no, no, there's nothing addictive about nicotine or anything like that. So why were they trying to genetically engineer tobacco to have more of it? You have to wonder, don't you? To explain this kind of magic, the thing is, we've got these molecular biology tools. We can actually treat genes like Lego. You can put together any blocks you want. So in this case, we've got a, an eggplant gene, we've got an apple gene, we've got a potato gene, and the chimeric gene over here is just showing us we can take one piece, 
from one species, one piece from another species, and another from another, we've got a chimeric gene, it might give us a new trait that we want to put into our plant or animal of interest. So by 1996, remember it was only 1983 that people first were able to do this, by 1996 GM tomatoes, maize and soybean were released and started to be taken up by farmers. That was a crucial time. If farmers didn't like it, no one was going to grow it. It had to make them more money, it had to improve their profitability, it had to make agriculture simpler and more efficient. And that worked, or farmers wouldn't have grown it. The downside to that was the traits that were being dealt with here were all about making life better for farmers and enabling them to produce food more efficiently and more cheaply. None of that translated into the minds of people who were buying the food and eating it. I don't care if a plant's insect resistant or not. In fact, maybe I do care if a plant's insect resistant because what did you use to make it insect resistant? These are the sorts of doubts that were in, in people's mind. Truth is though, by 2018, almost 200 million hectares of GM crops are grown around the world. Now I've turned this into a map of Europe. Well, I've said this is a map of Europe I'd like to have and Lara Simone has actually drawn it. But if we were to put all the GM soybean in the world into Europe, we would cover all of the United Kingdom and all of France. All the lakes, the rivers, we, sorry, we'd have to get rid of Paris. We'd have to clear Paris and just put soybean there. We'd have to do the same with maize for Spain. Cotton would cover the whole of Italy. No more Alps. We'd have to laser level them so we could grow cotton. That's how cotton's grown. Canola takes over the Czech Republic and, of course, Germany. I have to say something about Germany. Germany is the most anti-GMO country in the world. Deutschland sagt nein. Richtig? It does. But Martin Keim, who's from the University of Göttingen in Germany, he did an analysis of what the first 20 years of GM crops gave us, and he said overall it led to a 37% less pesticide, 22% increase in crop yields, and more importantly, 68% increase in farmer incomes all over the world where GM crops were used. Now, if they didn't do that, people weren't going to grow them. No doubt about that, because farmers have to make a living, right? But he also said 80% of the population is anti-GM and the other 20% of people don't care. Our first crop in Australia was BT cotton. Beautiful photo taken by Jess Lehman, who's a, a cotton farmer. Um, before BT cotton was available, we had this pest, Heliothus, and Heliothus ate cotton like it was going out of fashion. And most, by the early 90s, most cotton farmers were spraying every second week, or sometimes more so, to control Heliothus. And the Heliothus started to develop resistance. So by the time we got to the early 90s, endosulfan, which was the main insecticide being used, was being sprayed weekly on every cotton farm in a cotton growing region. Can you imagine? Now, I, uh, shortly after I recovered from my celery scars, I went up to Biloela and worked with a sorghum breeder up there. Um, and he invited me over for the weekend to his place. He was American. He said, have you ever had chili? And I said, yeah, I've had a chili. No, 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 proper chili. And we sat down and we started eating chili and this brown snake appeared out of nowhere. Naturally, being a you know, brave young Australian, or Queensland, Queensland, I mean, even better than an Australian, <laughs> I picked up a hoe and had a bit of a go at it. And then it had a bit of a go at me. And in the end, the hoe became a pogo stick. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ray, the sorghum breeder, appeared from, he was from Texas, he appeared from out of the front door with a shotgun. That pogo stick, I was moving faster than I have ever moved on a hoe as a pogo stick. He pointed his shotgun at the snake and it ran up inside a welding machine. I thought, is he going to shoot that welding machine? Next minute, the phone rang. Mrs. Brangman goes inside and she comes outside and she says, quick, everyone! I'm going, oh my God, 
It's gone inside the welding machine. It's called its family. They're all coming. <laughs> and then we all raced over to the washing machine. We had to bring in the washing. I said, what's going on? She said, oh, the neighbour just phoned. He's going to spray his cotton. And that was life in cotton-growing areas. You didn't want to spray when school was, kids were going to school or kids were coming out of school. You didn't want to spray when people are having their session at the beer garden. There were all sorts of social issues involved. And then people started to wonder about, what about our waterways? We're starting to get fish dying. There was huge amounts of endosulfone in the water. Now with BT cotton, it's only sprayed once or twice a year, usually for the other insects that weren't heliothus. So the reason why BT cotton became such a success is realistically it's social license. Endosulfan and beer gardens don't mix. Plus the cotton is mostly Roundup ready. Overall, cotton, BT cotton as grown in Australia has an 89% decrease in pesticide use. And that's a massive drop in the amount of chemicals that are being used used on cotton. There's also the fact that we don't eat cotton, right? We wear it, so people are more comfortable with that. We're comfortable in our cotton clothes because we don't eat it, unless we go to the local fish and chip shop, because they, when you get all the lint off and turn it into cotton, what do you do with the seed? Well, you crush it because it's got this really good oil in it. And the really good thing about the oil is you can stick it in a deep fryer and you can heat it, you can cool it down, you can heat it, you can cool it down, it doesn't go rancid. You do that with olive oil, it'll stink the next day. The chips will smell like fish, but there won't have been any fish in it. With cottonseed oil, you can do it for quite a long time. It has those wonderful attributes that the fish and chip shop guy likes. BT cotton got released in India. You can see it was released in 2003. The thing you will notice for the first years was there was hardly any increase in the actual area of cotton grown, but production went up because, mostly because, Indian farmers could not afford the chemicals they needed to control heliothus. India became so proud, they became a cotton exporter. They said, we have become middle class because like the rest of the middle class world, we can now send our cotton to China and buy Chinese t-shirts. How is that for a definition of being middle class? <laughs> and the plant scientists live happily ever after. Life was so good. We'd done our work. We're going to keep doing our work. What could possibly go wrong? Well, we didn't live happily ever after because we got schmacked and we didn't even see it coming. Suddenly there was this backlash about GMOs led by people like Greenpeace, etc. They didn't like things about this technology. A number of things were things that they didn't like. Let's talk about some of those, perhaps. Vandana Shiva, who's an anti-GM activist from India, said 400,000 Indian farmers have committed suicide since the failure of BT cotton. Two weeks later, she said 325,000. Then she said 255,000. Then she said 270. She makes it up as she goes along. But she's... Anyway, hundreds of thousands of Indian farmers have committed suicide because of their BT cotton crop failing. Prince Charles, he called it an abomination. He said it's gene tinkering, it's not natural. He actually said that if we all grow these crops, we're going to go into unmentionable awfulness. Uh, let's not mention Brexit. <laughs> One of my favourites, Zen Honeycutt. She runs this group called Moms Across America. Um, she makes her money out of selling organic produce online. There's actually a really nice movie called Food Evolution, which I'd ask you to see if you were interested in it. But she was interviewed on that. And she said, I don't need scientific studies. I don't need the FDA, the USDA. It's not about science. My moms know what is good for us and our kids. And Gwyneth, I mean, you can read that. I don't know what that means. It means something to Gwyneth, but that's probably what you can expect from someone who runs a website called Goop. <laughs> but there arose a lot of GMO facts. Firstly, GMO foods, they're all toxic. We've also got the 400,000 farmers who have supposedly committed suicide. Then there's BT corn killed monarch butterflies. Farmers are forced to grow GM crops. 
All GM crops require toxic chemicals or they won't grow, and GM's not organic. GM foods aren't toxic. We've been eating them since 1996. This is a graph of the suicide rate in India amongst female and male um, farmers in the cotton growing states, and it's continued that trajectory, it's going down because people are actually growing more and more cash crops. They're making money. They're able to send their kids to school. They're able to buy shoes for their kids because they're actually making money out of growing cotton. There's also reports saying that many of the farmers were committing suicide by drinking glyphosate, um, which we'll talk a little bit about glyphosate as we go on, but you'd have to drown in it before you could actually die of the toxicity. So we've busted that myth. BT corn didn't kill monarch butterflies. It did if you took pollen and put it all over the surface of a petri dish and then put a couple of monarch butterfly larvae on it. There was enough BT toxin in some of the pollen to do that. But it turns out that they just never got enough of that pollen or BT from the leaves to die. And in fact, one of the bigger reasons for the, I mean, there's, of course, there's climate change, but I would say there is evidence to suggest that one of the bigger reasons for the decline in monarch butterfly populations in North America is actually from Roundup Ready crops, because there's less weeds. They eat the weeds in cornfields and soy fields. Because so many of those are now clean because of Roundup, clean of weeds, the food source has gone down. I've already discussed this, farmers aren't forced to grow GM crops, then there's this one. We have to put terrible chemicals on them. This is uh, corn or maize. This is what corn borer looks like. It's not pretty. Um, if you have BT corn, the larvae dies in the first day of eating whatever it is. A bigger problem with, it's not so much the loss of a few grains, a bigger problem with those corn borers is they bore in through that side of, the, you know, we've got that, those wonderful leaf sheets around the outside of the, of the corn, and then that allows the entrance of fungi, fungi like Aspergillus and Fusarium, which actually produce toxins. So aflatoxin being one of the major causes of liver disease and liver cancer in people who are eating mouldy grain. So you can reduce that as well. And Producing, for example, fungal disease resistance, you don't need fungi. Uh, sorry, you don't, you don't need a fungicide. This is powdery mildew in grapes. This is a terrible thing, Phytophthora infestans, late blight in potato. You might have heard of it. I saw Andre Drenth here in the lab. He did his PhD on it. He taught me all about it. I know more about potato blight than anyone in the room except Andre. I know 1% of what Andre knows about it. So that one's not quite right either. Then we've got the issue about GM. It's not organic. Have you eaten organic food today? All the time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> organic means relating to or derived from living matter. All foods organic, uh, except maybe salt. And as we know, we're not going to eat salt anymore. That's the main cause of death in people. It doesn't even matter if it's pink. Pay more for the pink, it'll kill you just as quickly. Although it might be organic, because some of them are labelled as that. But may, I'll, I'll accept that, because we're the, isn't the pink colour supposed to come from the, the, the shrimp that lived in the salt beds? Certified organic is what people are saying when they mean GM is not organic. Certified organic is different, like quite different. Um, if you're religious and you know that there are other people who have a variant of your form of religion and they call themselves Presbyterian or Baptist or I might be Islamic but I'm 
a, a Shia rather than a Sunni, etc. Organic certification schemes are just like that. They are different religions. They truly are. Certified organic rules are quite clear, however. In Europe, you're allowed to use copper as a fungicide on your potatoes to control late blight. So it's a good fungicide. In 2001, the EU decided we're going to limit that to eight kilograms a year. And then a few years later, they dropped it to six kilograms. Why? Well, copper's a little bit toxic, but also it was building up in the soil. It was actually becoming quite a good herbicide. Nothing else would grow. <laughs> the UK Soil Association, they're one of the organic groups, says you can use six kilograms per hectare per year, but only if you tell us. You have to fill out a form and tell us you're using it. But if it's a really wet year, we'll actually let you use a little bit more, but you still have to apply. Germany and Switzerland said, no, 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 it's getting too toxic. We're dropping it to between three and four. And then other parts of Europe, Scandinavia, Netherlands, said, no, no copper. No copper is allowed in organic or conventional farming. Uh, some of the outcomes of that is that in the Netherlands, if you want to buy organic potatoes, you have to get them from Germany. <laughs> but with grapes, it's different. Eight kilograms wasn't going to cut it with grapes. Powdery mildew is a terrible disease, so if you want to grow, if you want to have your organic wine, know that it has probably been sprayed with up to 38 kilograms of copper. <laughs> so they're clearish. The only thing they would agree on is that GM crops are not organic because they're not natural. Spraying huge amounts of copper sulphate on crops is totally natural. We can all appreciate that. Look, I don't want to make fun of organic, but I do want to make fun of organic marketing. 100% chemical free. What was the last time you ate something that was 100% chemical free? Did you enjoy it? I mean, even if you're a breatharian, there's still oxygen and nitrogen. I think they're chemicals. This one really gets to me. There's a surf shop on the Gold Coast that sells chemical free zinc cream. But I do want to make fun of biodynamic agriculture. Here's a biodynamic ice cream. No, no, it's Preparation 500. Preparation 500 is a cow horn. You fill it with manure. You dig holes in autumn. You bury it. In spring, you bring it back out of the soil because it's done wonderful things. You then grind it up and you add water and you spread the contents of that cow horn with its manure over one hectare. The amount of nitrogen in these grains here is more than you would get out of that, just those few grains, is more than nitrogen than you would get out of that Preparation 500. It's a pagan ritual, I think, is the best way to look at it. But wait, there is more. They go up to 508. Uh, uh, pff, you know, they do sound like Levi's jeans, don't they? Um, my favourites are 504. It's stinging nettle. What does it do? Well, it helps the soil to develop an intelligence to accommodate the particular plants which are growing in it. <laughs> Put a bit of stinging nettle in the soil and it's, oh, I'm ready for that sugar beet this year. Last year, I didn't really like what I had last year, that barley, but this year I'm ready to go. And 502, well, you've got to kill a stag. It can't be any old deer. It has to be a male deer, not a female deer. That'd be dough. Um, so you get a stag's bladder, you put yarrow flowers in it, you hang it up in the sun during summer, and then you bury it. You don't actually spread it out. I don't know what it does, but it sounds good. I'm not even sure what yarrow is. I'm sure it's very pretty. But part of the narrative that came across from this whole thing was it was big ag, big mean ag versus organic. It was David versus Goliath. And Goliath was the most evil corporation in the world, Monsanto, who were also known as Monsatan. It's been taken over by a German company called Bayer. So now Greenpeace has a marketing opportunity. They can't have a march which is millions against Monsanto. They can do billions against Bayer. How good is that? 
And who doesn't like the underdog? I mean, after all, look at Monsanto here, evil company that it was, even though it doesn't exist anymore. Annual sales of 15 billion. That's inconceivable. Uh, wouldn't you love a piece of that action? Whereas poor little Whole Foods Market, with their wheelbarrows out the front with organic purple and red corn chips that were grown lovingly by a Mexican farmer up in the highlands to keep it away from evil GM crops, their annual sales are not nearly that much. They're exactly the same. And they've been taken over by Amazon. But remember, organic agriculture is 100% chemical free. Remember that messaging. Organic agriculture only has allowable inputs. They don't use chemicals, they use allowable inputs. Here's a list of their allowable inputs. Uh, one of my favourites is rotenone. It's the ground up root of a plant. It's got an oral lethal dose of 60 milligrams in rats. What does that mean? It means oral lethal dose is you get a population of rats, you feed them with a certain dose, and you get the dose until half the rats have died. So it's the oral lethal dose that kills 50% of the population. This is why we don't do this experimentation in humans. In fact, a lot of it we don't do in rats anymore either. We don't think that's really fair for the rats. Um, caffeine's pretty poisonous as well. It's only half as poisonous as rotenone. You need twice as much of it. Um, that's about as much as you'd get in perhaps 28 to 30 espressos. So don't drink 28 or 30 espressos. Copper sulphate, of course, it's pretty toxic. Lime sulphur, even chocolate. Salt's up there, pink or otherwise. Vinegar, so all the things you put on your salad are more poisonous than glyphosate. So just to highlight there, so glyphosate is the only thing on this list that's not an allowable input. You can use homeopathic remedies on some of your organic preparations if you want. Remembering that that's no active ingredient, it's the same as water. Water will kill you as well. The oral lethal dose of water is 900 mils per kilogram of your body weight. It's hyponatria. People have died from drinking too much water. What they really die from is too low a sodium and you keel over and die. We have genetically modified versions of disease resistance plants. We have resistance to powdery mildew and grapes. We have resistance to this terrible late blight. But organic agriculture continues to spray with chemical free copper and has half the productivity. So you need twice as much land area to produce the same amount of that crop. If you don't remember, potato late blight was the cause of the Irish potato famine. And as you can see, this is one of the major plant disease issues in terms of world population. My mum's name is Flanagan. I can probably owe myself the fact that I live in a wonderful place like Brisbane because of this. That's not true. He was sent out as a convict. <laughs> Nina Fedorov said, if the whole world switched to organic, we wouldn't be able to feed the world. We'd maybe be able to feed half. Because most crops, you can only get about half the productivity. So we'd either have to double the land area. We, we could clear the Amazon. That'd be fine. We could grow organic agriculture in the Amazon. But is that what we want? Klaus Ammann actually went a little bit further than that. He said the Nazis put out all that fake news about Jews and how bad they were. And he said the anti-GM activists, the Greens and Greenpeace in Germany used exactly the same techniques. And now the minds of many people in Germany is closed to further debate. But all we can say is that GM is not certified organic. But the organic industry chose GM as a wonderful way to increase market share and then used links to activists to ensure that the stigmatisation of GM crops made people feel a little bit dodgy about it. So how was the only way you were going to avoid eating GM crops? Eat organic. Pay double. But currently still, there's 10 different crop species released with GM traits. But the Australian Greens say GMOs, this is on their website, this is their official policy, GMOs have not been proven safe to human health. 
substitute any one of those other words in there. Believe it or not, every single one of these has killed people. Even bathrooms. Did you know that the bathroom is the place in your house where you are most likely to have a fatal accident? Did you know that horses are the animal that kills more Australians than any other animal every year? I've already talked about water. 23 years of GMO consumption, not a single death and no zombies found either. I'll finish my talk just talking about the new kid in town, genome editing techniques. What is gene editing and why should you care? Now, when I was putting this together, I thought, am I going to sing this? And I thought, I'm feeling good. You are going to hear me sing. You know the song, sing along. Let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. If you read, you begin with ATG, if you're a RNA polymerase too. That is. Let's see if I can make this any easier for you. Doe, a beer. Uh, oh, a gender neutral beer. We can't do female or male here. We're doing gender, although this is Tor's hammer. So maybe it's not gender neutral. It's actually barley wine. It's about 9% alcohol. It tastes absolutely fantastic. Two of these, you won't walk for days. <laughs> but a case study, you drink beer, what happens? Beer contains ethanol. Most of you know that. Ethanol is a flavour enhancer. Too much so for some humans. This tastes so good. It's also a toxin and a carcinogen. But fortunately for us, we've got livers. Your liver comes to the rescue. It produces an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. The gene is actually in every cell of your body, but it's only expressed in the liver. It's switched on. And it's actually switched on. It gets upregulated when you get that beer into your blood system or any other form of ethanol, which is good. You can actually train your ADH1 to be more active. To do that, you drink more barley wine, beer, scotch, whatever you want. You can train your enzymes to be more present, ready to go. ADH1 expression is quite complicated, but I'm going to try and make it seriously. The, the genes all hang around together on your chromosome 4. And there are variants of different types. So ADH1C, there are variants of that that protect against alcoholism. There are other variants that increase the risk of al alcoholism. So it just depends on which gene you have. There are variants on ADH1B. When it's defective, you can't break down alcohol very well. The outcome of that, you get a red face soon after drinking. Some of us have got friends who we go out and they have half a beer and suddenly their face turns red. You have to start to wonder, have you been eating cream of celery soup? But no. It's to do with the ADH1 gene. So these are all called alleles. They're variants. They're just different versions of the gene. They, they express more. They express less. They don't express at all. They express a different enzyme. Or they express in response to different signals. Anyone some foie gras? So I've just changed your gene expression. You're looking at that and thinking, oh, that's disgusting. I quite like chicken livers myself, but usually when they're a bit more processed than that. Gene editing is a way to change gene expression. So we can do all these things. We can make them express more or less, not express at all, etc., or express in response to different signals. So we can go from something that's rust susceptible to rust resistant. We can go from something that's got horns and something that's got polled. Now, those of you who are looking, and are into this sort of thing, will notice that there's other differences about these as well. One's a female and one's a male. <laughs> but wait on, isn't this a GMO? Surely this is a GMO. It sounds like GMO to me. Well, if you live in North America, it's not. If you live in Japan, it's not. If you live in South America, it's not. If you live in Europe, they decided, yes, it's a GMO. In Australia, it depends. Of course. So we have to work out what does it depend upon. So I'm going to give you a few ideas as to what we are allowed to do with gene editing and what we might not be allowed to do. <laughs> so if I, this is how I transform sorghum, which is my favourite crop. We shoot genes into plants. It was an American invention, of course. If you want to solve a problem, shoot it, use a gun. 
You can take a jellyfish protein, we can put it into sorghum, we can get it expressed in different ways. We can say, oh, we only want it expressed in the root tip. Oh, we only want it expressed in the, in the embryo. Oh, we only want it actually expressed in protein bodies inside a developing grain. And we can make pretty pictures with it. It's pretty nice, I guess. If you don't like green, you can get other colours. These are real. You can look at them online. Glowfish. They're from a company called Live Aquaria. Goldfish are so last century. You just need a little bit of UV light in your lighting scheme to, for them to properly show their true colours. But as John once said, John Don once said in 1623, no gene is an island entire of itself. Every gene is a piece of the cell, a part of the organism. Well, he would have said that, but genes were only invented in 1906. But with GM crops, we actually put the gene in in a random place. So sometimes we get some random results. Here's an example from my lab. This is sorghum, if you don't know it. This is the wild type sorghum. This is a gene, this is one, a sorghum where we've put a gene in. This is a sorghum where we've put the same gene in. The difference in the positions that we've got them in, one of them actually led to down regulation of the gene in the growing area and one led to up regulation. So the one with down regulation has got no branches at all. The one with up regulation produces huge amounts of branches. Serendipity, but a very useful finding for us to help to understand these things. But I'm going to talk now about a thing called CRISPR-Cas9. In CRISPR-Cas9, we're not putting in a gene in a random place. We're actually targeting the gene itself. So you need to know, there'll be an exam on this later, you need to know that there's three main components. There's PAM, there's the guide RNA, and then there's the CAS, which is actually the enzyme. That's the thing that does the work. But the PAM and the guide RNA are really important because they say, this is where I want the enzyme to lock onto the DNA and cut it. So imagine, here's a piece of DNA, double-stranded. It's got the PAM on both strands. The guide RNA binds to that around the PAM and forms this, this nice hairpin structure. It recruits the Cas9 enzyme. And the Cas9 enzyme says, this is the spot. Time to cut the DNA, and it cuts the DNA. What happens next? DNA repair. Fortunately, DNA repair is a good thing. I am a big fan of DNA repair, or I would have died a long time ago, and so would all of you. I know I put you off food earlier with liver. This is my arm, believe it or not. This is the arm of a person who has lived in Brisbane for more than 50 years, and sunscreen didn't seem to actually be developed, chemical free or otherwise, when I was a kid. If you didn't peel at least once during summer, you were one of those kids who sat inside and read books, right? I'm going to draw your attention. There's various different pigments here. Many of them are to do with mutations. Some of them have turned into cancers. I've had them removed. This white spot here, that's where a particular gene that's involved in the production of pigment has been knocked out and it's become albino. So it's like a reverse freckle, an albino spot. That's a gene edit. It's a gene knockout. There's three possible options when you have DNA repair. Most of the time, it's accurately repaired. Move on into the next generation. Nothing happened here. Other times, you get inaccurate repair. So you might insert the wrong nucleotide. You might miss some nucleotides. You might put ex extra nucleotides there. Sometimes we can actually use a template and say, what we want to do is we want you to put in some specific new nucleotides here so that it totally changes that gene. The important thing is that the inaccurate repair, where we're just getting a little deletion or a little insertion, this will not be a GMO. Repair with a new template, anything that involves template, that's going to be a GMO. Have to remember this is decision pending from the government. The federal government has made the, they've made the rules, they have sent it out to the state governments, they have to get two thirds of the state governments to agree that, yep, yeah, we agree with that. But that's what's probably going to happen in Australia. Why will this not be a GMO? The main reason it won't be a GMO is because the edit is indistinguishable from natural mutation. We can't detect it. It's impossible to police it. 
my prediction is in Europe, where this has been banned, you're going to see all sorts of companies releasing new lines of things that have a mutation in there and be saying to the European Court of Justice, you show us that this is made from CRISPR and read my finger. There's lots of CRISPR products already in the pipeline. Resistance to devastating diseases. Improved food quality. This is one of my favourites in the middle. So Kaisha Gao, who we've been doing a bit of work with, she's from the Chinese Academy of Science. The biggest rice growing variety in China. The plant breeder came along and said, can you make this a fragrant rice? She said, sure. She edited one gene. It's now a fragrant rice, like a jasmine rice. He said, that was pretty good. Can you do another 10? And she did. Any rice can become a fragrant rice with CRISPR technology. This one here, this is a wild tomato. Just changing six genes gave you larger fruit, more fruit, smaller seeds, higher lycopene content. It's domestication with six genes being changed. It's a pretty neat technology. Our current research on improved feed quality shows us that single gene edits can give us larger grain, more grain, higher protein, higher digestibility for humans and animals. These are some of my favourites, mostly because I like pig. I like bacon too. So I, I, I like pigs until they turn into bacon, and then I like bacon. In Europe, poor sign reproductive and respiratory syndrome causes losses of 1.5 billion every year. Some clever scientists noticed in some wild pigs, they were totally resistant to this disease. So they found out that it was one particular gene which had a base pair different to our domesticated pig, and they change that in the pig, and the pig is totally resistant to this disease. 1.5 billion, one gene. This one, these are my chooks, aren't they good? So, but we know avian flu virus affects all poultry. It's also transmitted to humans. There have been outbreaks of avian flu, most commonly to do with people's proximity to chickens or ducks. A single edit leads to resistance in the fowl populations. It also means they're no longer a host, so they can no longer give us avian flu. So a single gene edit, again recognised from a wild relative that doesn't get avian flu. That's a good outcome for not just the, the poultry themselves, but for us. So, as John Don might have said, ask not for whom the Cass enzyme edits, it edits for thee. So thank you very much for listening. Oh, did I mention my book? All right. Well, now we'll move to the, the Q&A part of the, uh, the seminar. Um, I think I can guarantee that Ian won't be singing during this part of the, uh, the, uh, the talk, so don't get too worried. Um, so I think we'll just jump right in. Great, great talking. Um, the first question I, we have from the audience is from Tamea, and she would like to know what do you think is the way forward for consumer acceptance of gene edited crops so it doesn't go down the route of GMO? Um, yeah that's a, that's a great question and, and thanks to Maya. That I'm, uh, I only know one person called Tamea and she lives in Canberra so I'm high in Canberra if that's you. Um, I, I think um, if we use uh, gene editing technology to actually um, to actually develop um, better food qualities that either give people um, a health benefit or make something um, last longer. For example, you can, you can do things, I'll just go with potato as an example. We can use gene editing to make potatoes that don't brown after they've been cut, um, which is mostly a processing issue, not so much a, a, a big deal at home but also we can make ones that, that when you cook them, they don't produce uh, things like acrylamide, which can be carcinogenic. Um, and that's been, that's been demonstrated to work quite well. 
So you can actually get um, potatoes that are that are easy easier to um, easier to process and that also don't produce acrylamide and therefore you get health benefit outcomes and and, and, and they're actually cheaper to to produce. So that's that's an example. But I think those sorts of examples that give people a nutritional benefit um, are really going to be the, the the ones that are the are the best. Okay. I'll move to the next question now. Um, what happens to nutrient content after genetic modification? The nutrient content. Well, I mean, if if you if you um, do any sort of genetic modification that's to do with disease resistance or drought resistance or something like that, um, there's no effect on the on the nutritional content whatsoever. However, you can and people have done um, genetic modification of plants so that they can increase the vitamin A content, for example, the, the iron content, the zinc content. Um, so right now, you may have heard of a thing called golden rice. Golden rice has been, um, well, actually has, was developed more than 12, 15 years ago. It's rice with a high content of vitamin A. Um, and it's been able to be shown that uh, when, you, when you cook and eat golden rice, you can, from, a, from a cup of rice, you can get pretty much what your daily requirement of vitamin A would be. Um, in parts of the world where the poorest, most resource poor subsistence farmers and their children live, um, vitamin A is one of the vitamin A deficiency is one of the biggest causes of early childhood death and also blindness because the vitamin A is important for the development of the retina. It's also important for the development of um, um, much of the immune system. So by delivering, for example, vitamin A as a um, by way of um, genetic modification, and, and and you can you can do this with only manipulating a couple of genes. You get vitamin A um, precursor production in rice, which then we we use. It's it's actually a beta carotene, same stuff as you can get in, for example, carrots. Um, and you can eat the cooked rice and and get the beta carotene from that, and it has great nutritional outcomes. Okay, next question is from Brian. He wants to know, are there potential risks to food sovereignty through gene editing technology? Yeah, food, food sovereignty is a, a sort of a, a, an, interesting, an interesting concept, um, which look, I've, I've got to say, in all honesty, being, um, being a, a stupid scientist, I perhaps don't really quite understand um, what it means to a lot of people. Um, but the, the, the whole issue of being able to control what we eat um, does give you the... Um, I don't think anyone can control where their food comes from unless they're growing all of it themselves. Uh, so that's, that's, my, that's my simplistic, I guess, non-answer to that question. Um, but if you, if you really want to know where your food comes from, um, food traceability is something that is increasingly... Um, increasingly be fo being followed by many producers. Um, it's particularly the case at the moment with a lot, of, uh, a lot of animal produce, probably because it's at the higher end of the market um, from value point of view. Um, but increasingly we're, we're understanding where our food comes from as consumers. Okay. Uh, Crystal Conception would like to know, what do you think about herbicides? Do you think we should embrace gene editing weed science and forget about herbicide? Uh, well, I, I, can, I can honestly say if we were able to use gene editing um, to make sure that, that weeds didn't actually grow, um, that would be a wonderful outcome. I'm not quite sure how that actually works. Um, that it, agriculture would be wonderful if we didn't have to use any chemical inputs whatsoever. Um, However, one thing about that is the reason why farmers, for example, have embraced um, Roundup Ready as an example in soybean is because soybeans, not a particularly tall plant and it's, it's slow to actually um, establish and get out of the ground. So the risk of being overtaken by weeds is quite high. Um, as farmers have gone to what we call no-till agriculture where they're not ploughing many times during the, the season or prior to planting, um, the only way you can um, control weeds at the moment is with herbicide. And then by having a herbicide resistant crop, it means that as the crop is, once it's perhaps four to six weeks old, you can apply herbicide to the, 
to the field and get rid of all the, the weeds. The, the great example of no-till, um, there is, it, it saves a lot of input costs for the farmer. It saves on a lot of diesel, which is good for the environment, um, good for the farmer's bottom line. But more importantly, it actually, um, it actually saves um, a lot of the topsoil uh, by reducing erosion that, uh, that we get by. If you, if you plough a field totally and make it all nice and clean and ready to plant, uh, and then you get a storm, that's when half your topsoil ends up in the, in the creek or the, or the neighbour who's just down the slope from you. Okay. This next question is a bit more technical. So how randomly is the PAM sequence in CRISPR linked to a trait? Is it like a marker or...? Yeah, so the, the, uh, uh, I, I don't want to get into a really technical answer, but the PAM sequence for most um, enzymes, because Cas9, the fact that it's called Cas9 shows you that there are other versions of the enzyme available and people are also making, I suppose, engineering enzymes. So the PAM site is really only three nucleotides. Um, so three base pairs. So although in some genes it's very difficult to find a PAM site, most genes will have at least one PAM site in them. Many genes will have multiple PAM sites in them. So it gives you the ability to actually um, make edits in different parts of the gene, if you like, if, if you want to. We tend to, most of the stuff we're doing at the moment is to actually knock out the gene. So, so long as we get a gene edit that interrupts that gene and stops that gene from effectively being expressed and translated into a protein, um, that, that's, that's the level of success we have had. It gets a lot more complex when you're trying to, um, for example, change an enzyme's activity. You don't want to knock it out, you just want to make that enzyme slightly different. Um, and that's where sometimes not having a PAM site in the right place is going to be, make it, make it a bit of a problem for you. Okay. Uh, Daniel would like to know, uh, the gene technology is fast evolving. What's your take for democratising access for developing countries, especially building local capacity to national programs? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. So one of the, one of the wonderful things about, um, about gene editing technology um, is that it's a fairly simple technique to do. So anyone who can do um, plant tissue culture and, and basic transformation can do gene editing. Um, I think the ultimate in democratization though is um, at the moment that, so I showed pictures of plants in tissue culture. At the moment, the way we do our gene editing is it, it requires tissue culture. However, what we and other people, so Lee Hickey I know at Coffee, but many other people around the world are developing techniques where you can actually undertake gene editing, hopefully in the glass house. The ultimate dream would be the ability to be able to do gene editing in the glass house, potentially by spraying the, the, the enzyme and the guide RNAs onto the plant in such a way that it gets into the growing point of the plant. Um, if we can, and, and when I say we, I just mean plant scientists in general, if we can deliver that technology in a way like that, it means that gene editing basically becomes a plant breeding tool and is available to all plant breeding companies, whether that, uh, whether, whether that breeding is, whether the breeding program is a breeding program in the highlands of Ethiopia, um, in, in the, the, the highlands of Peru or, or in, the, in the equator in Malaysia, it's available to everyone on, on the crops that you can grow. Okay. We've got lots of questions here. So this is from Cass. She wants to know, how much genetic gain opportunity have we lost from not making GMO as unrestricted as gene editing? Uh, well, um, that's, a, that's, that's a fascinating question and, and one that people have done measurements on. There's a guy called, for example, Stuart Smythe at University of Saskatchewan. He's published, he's, he's more of an economist. He's um, and, a, and a farming systems person. He's done a lot of um, analyses of how much people have lost due to not being able to um, have access to GMOs. Now, of course, the biggest losses at the moment are in Europe. Um, even though we like to think, uh, and, and publicly it's sort of cited that no one in, in Europe grows any GM crops, there's quite a bit of uh, BT insect resistant maize grown in Spain. And the reason for that is because otherwise they wouldn't be able to grow uh, it. Because resistance to insecticides has got so bad. Um, so they, they, they would prefer not to grow um, 
the insect resistant um, BT crops, but they're doing it because they have to. Um, we know that from a productivity point of view and from an environmental outcome point of view, if all jurisdictions in the world had access to the technology and were able to um, develop it, farmer profitability would go up, but more importantly, sustainability would go up because we have to uh, remember that um, in, despite the marketing, things that are calling themselves organic, et cetera, are not the most sustainable. And the reasons why they're not the most sustainable is because if you have to double the food production area to get the same amount of production, um, what's the outcome? Well, it means that, that grasslands and forests that exist uh, have to be cleared for us to turn them into agriculture. Um, so from a sustainability point of view, yield per unit area is, is a wonderful part of, of sustainability. And it's particularly a wonderful part of sustainability if you can do it without adding additional chemical inputs into the agriculture. Okay. Well, you mentioned marketing, so that leads to our next question. So Samir wants to know, if you were to change the name of GMO or genetically modified organism, does it sound scary to Europeans? What would you call it if you're starting from scratch? Gee, that'd be, that, that's a great question, isn't it? I mean, maybe, maybe we should ask the, the current Australian Prime Minister. He's from marketing. Uh, he, he might have a better idea. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, when, when we started to, um, to, to do this work in the, in the 80s, um, we just called it genetic engineering. Um, it, it, they became known as GMOs because that was the, um, that was the words that, for example, Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth used. I mean, to me, genetic, I mean, any sort of engineering means that you're hopefully doing something to make it better for, for mankind, make it... Uh, make it uh, more sustainable, et cetera. I, I don't have any problem with the word genetic engineering, but I'm pretty sure a marketing person would disagree with me. I know the USDA is coming out with a labeling system. Um, and one of the words I think that they're using is, is um, it's, it's bio something, it's, it's bio, bio bread or bio breeding, something like that, because it's used by technology. So Sirinat, I hope I pronounced that properly, wants to know why is this this craze for non-GMO products among consumers despite strong scientific facts for gene editing technology? Well, I mean, it, it does come down, come back to what Klaus Hamann was saying about stigmatisation. If you stigmatise something and there's a, if there's, if there's fear, people will avoid it. Um, and um, fear... Um, and there's an alternative. So in a place like Australia, where most of us, there is, there is plentiful nutritious food available for us. Um, if, um, if someone tells us that GM stuff is bad and there's an alternative that doesn't cost us any more, we'll, we'll probably take it. Um, it's in parts of the world like sub-Saharan Africa where um, a lot of farmers are really leading the charge to have access to, to genetically modified and gene edited crop plants because they know it will enable them to have uh, a much higher level of productivity, it will enable them to feed their families, it will enable them to have excess crop production so they can take some to the market. So they're not just feeding their family, they're selling something in the marketplace so that they can buy their kids shoes. Okay, so this is a regulatory question about um, CRISPR and gene editing. So Alana wants to know, uh, last year Australia's gene technology regulations were amended to allow commercialization of certain gene edited crops without requiring gene technology uh, approval, um, namely using SDN1 gene editing techniques. Do you think the amendment should have gone further? Uh, well, <laughs> I would have, I would have loved um, if the technology allowed um, some small amount of template to have been used to, to make slight small changes to genes. Um, so, for example, to, to change the um, expression of a particular enzyme in ways that we can't do with with um, with knockout. So, for those of you who who don't know, I mean, SDN1 is a site directed nuclease one technology. What it really means is that we're just um, we're not, we're allowing the, the cell to repair the gene in a random way. 
and the most common outcome of those random um, repair mechanisms is that just the gene gets knocked out. So that's what my lab has mostly been working on. If we were able to, for example, put in um, a small sequence or a small amount of template, which under the regulations is called SDN2, that would give us a much greater ability to, to manipulate some of the genes to, to give us better drought resistance, disease resistance, etc. But we can still do those, but the outcomes of those will be deemed to be genetically modified and therefore um, have to be have to be labeled as a GMO. Okay. Uh, next question from Meng. Uh, so based on LD50 toxicity value, glyphosate seems comparatively comparatively safer to use than other conventional chemicals. Do you know if they have also looked at the carcinogen carcinogenicity and use it to label something as organic? Um, so there's there's a lot of there's a lot of research has gone, <coughs> pardon me, into um, the use. So glyphosate is um, I'll, I'll step back and say glyphosate is a phenomenon, and it first started to be used in the 1970s um, when no-till agriculture became reality. The use of glyphosate around the world has has absolutely skyrocketed. It'd be the most used agricultural chemical on the planet. Um, the good news is in most cases that soil bacteria will break down um, glyphosate in the soil within two or three weeks um, because there are soil bacteria that can use glyphosate as a food source. So when I say break down, they're actually eating the stuff. Um, so um, the fact that it has really low toxicity is one thing. Harder to measure is even though things have low toxicity, what is their ability to, to be a carcinogen? There's a lot of um, research that has gone on to actually look at its carcinogenicity. No one has been able to find a direct link. The problem with a lot of the types of research that are done, and, it, and it's not to do with the people who do the research, it's just the type of research you can do for a long period of time. You have to do studies for quite a long time. Um, one, of the, one of the results that often people get to is, we can't rule out that it is a carcinogen. So they're not saying it's carcinogenic, but we can't rule out that it is. We can't rule out the fact that it might be a carcinogen. Um, and, and that's the nature of most things. It's like when you, yeah, I, I said, you know, that um, Toyotas have not been proven safe. Well, it's true. I mean, every day around the world, someone dies in a Toyota. It's not because the Toyota was intrinsically more dangerous than a, a Nissan or a VW or a Volvo. Um, it, it's just that uh, we, we can't Volvo. do those risks. Sorry, Brad. I, I... You're safe in a Volvo. Yeah. Safe in a Volvo. Yeah, maybe. Just everyone else isn't if you run them over. So this next question's right down your alley. Um, Hussain asks, what's your prediction of commercialization of gene-edited crops in terms of diversity as we see transgenic crops from the big players like uh, soybean, maize, cotton, canola seem to have been the first tranche of GM crops? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So the, it, it comes back to the fact that because um, gene edited crops, at least the, the SDN1 type, the simple edits, because they're not going to be regulated, it means there's not a huge cost to actually getting them to the market. The cost of getting to the market won't be much higher than any standard plant breeding. Uh, and that means there's going to be a lot of diverse traits out there. Um, there's already um, a soybean in the US, there's already a um, a, a mushroom in the US, it's, the, it's a mushroom that you can cut and then put in the fridge and it doesn't go brown for days. Um, the, the soybean is, uh, it's changed the oil quality of the soybean to make it uh, healthier for people. Um, there'll be a lot more of those. The reason why there's, uh, there's unfortunately such a small number of crops and traits available in GM is the cost of getting it through regulation. So if, if we were to, for example, with one of our sorghum lines and say, here's a GM sorghum, it's got higher protein and it's more digestible, this would be great for anyone who wants to feed it to pigs and chickens, this would be great for people in sub-Saharan Africa who want to eat it. Um, it would cost probably in the order of about 50 million US dollars to get that through all the regulation. Hence, most of the things that we're seeing that are GM crops are traits that have already gone through that regulatory process so we continue to see, oh, BT, well, we've looked at BT, we know it's safe, therefore we're gonna put some new BT um, crops out. 
oh, Roundup Ready. We've gone through the regulations with Roundup. It's easier for us to get an, a new Roundup Ready crop to market. Um, and that has led to a, um, a, a terribly small handful of crops. There's only 10 crops at the moment where there are currently genetically modified versions of those crops. Uh, if I was, if you want me to make a prediction, I'll make a prediction. I'll say in 10 years' time, there's probably going to be gene edited versions of, of at least 20 or 30 different crop species, and there'll be many, many traits within those species. Okay. Camilla would like to know how do you trace the GM fingerprint in GM modified crops? Are all GM technologies traceable? Uh, GM, GM technologies are traceable, and the reason for that is because you've um, um, in, in most cases, you've either um, you've downregulated an existing gene um, and you put in a construct to do that, or the way of doing it is that uh, if you've introduced a new gene. So the, the typical examples are so a BT. It's it's a it's a gene that came from Bacillus thuringiensis, a soil-borne bacteria. You put one of those genes into maize, soybean. It doesn't matter what what crop you put it in. Uh, it's, it's a piece of DNA that is not there in any other um, plant because it's come from a, a bacterium. So it's very, very easy to trace. Um, you can use PCR, for example, to trace it. Uh, now, a gene-edited crop, if you've done gene editing and then haven't got any of the, the remnants of a Cas9 gene or anything like that there in the genome, it's no different to um, an, a naturally occurring mutation. Um, and therefore, it's impossible for anyone to do an assay on that plant to say, we believe this plant has been gene edited because you can't distinguish it from a mutation. Okay. Um, Oscar says, I've heard that some GM crops don't produce viable seeds, and so farmers need to buy new seed every year. Is that another myth, or how problematic is that for farmers? Yeah, that's a, it's, it's, it's a myth and it's not a myth. I mean, the first part of the myth was that it was, um, it was Monsanto who developed it and they called it Terminator technology. So myth one to bust is it was actually developed by the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. Myth two, they never called it Terminator technology. That was the name that, um, because it was done around the time of some Terminator films. So Greenpeace thought, oh, let's call it Terminator and everyone will be scared of it. Um, that was a technology really that was designed to not um, ensure that um, it wasn't really about making people buy the seed every year. It was more about saying this is a good way to ensure that whatever trait we put into a maize crop, a potato crop or whatever, it won't pass on to the next generation because that generation can't make viable seeds. Sorry, potato is probably not a good example because we use pieces of potato, but you, you get what I mean with maize. Um, if you can't regrow that seed, um, then it also means that there's no escape of the genetic material um, from those grains to turn them into a super weed or any, anything else. Um, now, I, I would add to that that um, it's not the case so much in um, subsistence agriculture, but in um, the Western world where we're trying to produce food as cleanly and as efficiently and trying to maximise yield, etc. Most farmers will buy their seed every year because they know they've got good quality seed. They know that it comes with a germination percentage. They're buying a seed, it'll say, this seed has 95% germination. If it doesn't come up and establish well, you can go back to the company and say, you sold us bad seed, we want our money back. You've got to pay for our loss of crop. So it's, that's a really good quality assurance for farmers. If you keep the seed yourself and then you plant that seed and it's only got 30% germination, you're not going to get a crop and you've only got yourself to blame because you didn't have good quality seed to start with. Okay. So Aidan is asking a question for the urban gardeners. Do you ever see a time when gene editing could get to the stage where it is accessible for the backyard urban gardener? Without a doubt, because if, if we're going to do um, gene edited versions of, of lettuce and tomato, which have, I mean, they could have anything. They could have better nutritional quality. They could have um, insect resistance. They could have um, different color variations, et cetera. Um, because they're not regulated and, and as, as being um, genetically modified, 
there's no reason why they can't be made available to the backyard grower. And this was sort of in a, in a way when GM started in the 80s and 90s, we all thought that that was going to be the case. We all thought, oh, in, in, in 20 years time, we'll be, we'll be growing lettuces and, and pumpkins and all sorts of things that have got genetic modification and have resistance to downy mildew. We won't have to worry about diseases and overhead watering and blah, 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 blah. But it didn't happen because um, there's, there's no single market for backyard growers that is big enough for a company to pay the costs of getting it through regulation. With gene editing, because those simple edits are not regulated and there's no additional cost, I, I will guarantee that they'll be available. Okay, so Paul would like to know, have you tried to talk to the Greens about their GMO policy? Uh, yes. Do you want a longer answer? Um, so I actually contacted, uh, contacted the Greens in Australia um, and I was referred to their senators who's based in Melbourne um, and who's their agriculture spokesperson. I had a telephone call with her chief of staff um, talked about coming along and giving them a talk and they said, yep, that would be great, blah, 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 blah. And um, to date, nothing has happened. I, you know, I, I've, I've really got to say, I, I think there's, um, there's an issue there that quite a few people who are, um, uh, are scientifically educated enough within the Greens understand that there is no threat from gene-edited crops um, for... for agriculture, for humans, for food safety, and there are great benefits, but they're not willing to necessarily argue that because that's what politics is. Politics is deciding which battles you can win and which battles you can't. And there's quite a few people within the Greens who don't have any problem with GM, don't have any problems with gene editing, but they're not gonna go out there and, and, and argue that publicly. Okay. So Renee is wondering, why is Australia lagging with commercially available GM crops, only cotton and canola? Do you see BT cotton corn being available, especially with Fall Army Worm now present in Northern Australia? Yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, so the, the, at, at the moment, the maize industry in Australia is quite small. Uh, most of the parts of Australia where we, would, uh, where we could grow maize, most people are growing sorghum, predominantly because um, Compared to other parts of the world, we get a lot more heat and a lot more drought, uh, and sorghum generally outcompetes maize on those areas. However, now that fall armyworms here, if people really want to grow corn, um, it's likely that if we've got we've got two choices, we can, can we can start to ramp up the, the regime of spraying um, insecticides with the fall armyworm, which in the short term will be what what we have to do if we want to continue to grow maize. Uh, in the long term, a genetic solution to resistance to the fall army worm is all we've got. Worldwide, no one's been able to find a, um, any source of real resistance within the actual um, the maize gene pool. Uh, and the most um, resistant lines actually have um, insecticidal proteins in them, combinations of, of BT and, um, and, and other insecticidal proteins which, which stop the fall army worm from feeding when it's quite small. Uh, again, it comes down to money. Is the Australian market big enough for a company to say, yeah, we will take it through the necessarily regulatory procedure to market this in Australia? Um, and that's a conversation that, that seed companies are having internally right now. Uh, and they'll, they'll, um, they'll make their decision on economic terms. Is this going to be worth it for us. Are we going to get enough market share that we can pay for doing this? Um, and, and this is why we don't have very many things in Australia at the moment, because as it, as, as it turns out, the market for seed in Australia um, is tiny. One of, our, one of my colleagues, Mark Cooper, who's a professor in coffee, he worked for Pioneer in the United States for many years. And he said the entire maize market in Australia would be too small for even um, one single maize variety in the US. In other words, they would need to have a market bigger than the Australian market just to release a single maize variety. It's, it's all about money and the cost of seed production. Okay, this next question from the gallery. Uh, 
Synthetic biology products will be genetically modified organisms or derived from them. Do you think synthetic biology has a better chance of positive public perception than genetic engineering? Uh, well, yes and no, because I think, um, I think synthetic, bio synthetic biology um, in microbes where you're growing things in a contained uh, vessel, yes, because we've been doing that since forever, half of our drugs, um, vaccines, all those sorts of things, they're all really um, now products, getting to be products of synthetic biology. Um, where synthetic biology meets GMO is where we're actually starting to do things, for example, like grow vaccines in plants. That's, a, that's a, a, an interesting outcome of, of synthetic biology, where we're starting to grow um, you know, new materials, for example, in plants. I would say that it's, it's feasibly possible. Um, it's, um, it's highly possible under certain jurisdictions. Um, and it would be a very attractive um, a very attractive thing for people like, for example, in, in Australia, the sugarcane growers. Sugarcane growers in Australia cannot produce sugar um, for the, 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 what they're selling their sugar for is less than the actual cost of production. If they could use those large biomass crops to produce particular synthetic biology products, um, that would probably be what would save the, the sugarcane industry in Australia because I don't think sugarcane in Australia is ever going to be a viable product if we just continue to produce sugar from it. Okay, Ian, well, thanks for answering all those questions. I think we'll wrap up for today. Uh, thanks for taking part. It was a great and informative talk. I just want to let everyone know that today's recording will be emailed to you later this afternoon. You can find more webinars and pod podcasts on the UQ alumni website, which is uq.edu.au slash alumni. And thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.